The Great Storm. 8,000 sailors perished and more than 150 ships were wrecked when a terrible storm struck England. In November 1703, Henry Winstanley, gentleman, an amateur engineer, set out from Plymouth with a party of friends to inspect the recently completed Eddystone Lighthouse, which he had designed and built on a shelf of rock in the English Channel. Eddystone was one of Britain's first lighthouses. Skeptics had declared that its 80-foot stone and timber tower would not survive the fierce winter storms that swept the Channel. But Winstanley had no doubts. I wish I may be in my tower during the worst gale that ever blew, he often boasted. He was to have his wish. On November 26, 1703, a terrible storm roared out of the Atlantic and lashed the coast of Britain from Land's End to the tip of Scotland. When it subsided, more than 150 ships, including 10 men of war of the Royal Navy, had been sunk or driven ashore, and 8,000 sailors had perished. On the Goodwin Sands and the mouths of the Thames, the Humber and the Bristol Channel, along the rock-bound shores of Wales, Cornwall, Devon, masses of drifting wreckage marked the graveyards of many of the proudest ships in the British Merchant Marine. And on the morning of November 28th, the people of Plymouth could see spray beating over a stump of tower that was all that remained of the Eddystone Lighthouse. When Stanley and the others in the lighthouse had died when the upper part crashed into the boiling sea. The storm of 1703 could not have struck at a more calamitous time. The anchorages on the English coast were crowded with the greatest concentration of naval and merchant shipping for many years. England and France were locked in the war of the Spanish succession. While fighting raged in Flanders, warships of both nations scoured the Atlantic and Channel in search of homeward-bound merchantmen. Late in November, one convoy of 80 British merchant ships was anchored in Milford Haven in South Wales. Another fleet was in the Kentish Downs, and a third lay on the estuary of the River Humber on the east coast. On November 24th, Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel sailed into the Downs with a large part of the Atlantic fleet, ten men of war and many smaller cruisers, frigates and sloops. The wind was blowing hard from the northeast, but the Admiral saw no reason for the alarm. The Downs, protected by the sweep of the Kentish coast and the Goodwin Sands offshore, were regarded as a safe anchorage in any weather. Next day brought ominous signs of the coming terror. The wind shifted to a gale from the west. Black clouds covered the sky with unearthly gloom and unleashed storms of sleet and rain. Admiral Shovel put to sea with five of his largest ships, and running under almost bare masts, managed to beat round the North Foreland into the Thames. But there was to be no escape for most of the rest of his fleet, or for the thirty merchantmen trapped in the Downs. About noon on November 26, crashing peals of thunder heralded the arrival of the full fury of the storm. That evening, helpless watchers on the shore witnessed a scene of terror and destruction unparalleled in British maritime history. Some naval ships and merchantmen tried to get into the open channel but were driven aground or swept irresistibly into the foam-capped cauldron of the Goodwin Sands. Those who tried to remain at anchor saw their cables snap like cotton. Ships were driven against ship in hopeless confusion. Above the howling of the gale, people on the shore heard the grinding crashes as timbers splintered and masts went overboard. One East Indiaman rammed a naval hospital ship and sent her to the bottom in a few minutes. The 70-gun Northumberland heeled over before one further gust of wind and went down with every man. Small boats that put out from the coast were swamped or forced to return. Only one succeeded in getting alongside the warship Stirling Castle and saving a handful of men who jumped from the rigging into the sea. By dusk, at least twenty ships had foundered or were breaking up on the Goodwin Sands. Through the night, the boom of signal guns and flare of rockets marked the desperate appeals for help from vessels still struggling to survive. The storm raged all next day. Then at dawn on November 28th, the wind at last dropped, the sun glimmered from a watery sky, and the work of counting the toll could begin. 
Great masses of wreckage covered the downs and were heaped high on the Kentish beaches. Hundreds of corpses rolled in the shallows amid naval cannon, shattered casks, timbers and seaweed-tangled rigging. Four of Britain's proudest men of war, the Northumberland, the Restoration, the Mary and the Stirling Castle had vanished with 1,300 of their crews. A dozen smaller naval craft had also gone down. Of the 30 merchantmen in the Downs, only five were still afloat, mostly dismasted hulks. One was driven right across the Channel and was eventually beached at Dunkirk. Inhuman wreckers from Deal, Sandwich and Dover provided a grim epilogue to the great storm when they put in boats to plunder the ships shattered on the Goodwin Sands. Many wretched mariners were running about the sands or standing in the surf, hallooing and crying piteously to be taken off, said one eyewitness. But the boatmen, intent on securing the booty floating in the sea, heeded them not and abandoned them to be swept away and drowned in the returning tide. At last the horrified mayor of Deal offered five guineas a head for every wrecked seaman brought ashore alive. Encouraged by the bounty, fishermen succeeded in getting two hundred men off the good ones before the sea rolled over the remainder. The tragedy in the Downs was the worst incident in the storm, but similar scenes were repeated all around the coast of Britain. At Milford Haven in South Wales, a convoy of seven warships and nearly eighty merchantmen had assembled before making the dangerous passage up the Channel to London. The officer in command, Captain Soanes, of HMS Dolphin had cautiously delayed sailing because of reports of French privateers lurking off Land's End. The delay had disastrous consequences. Within twelve hours after the storm screamed out of the Atlantic, more than thirty merchant ships had founded and twenty had been driven aground in the muddy islets of Milford Haven. Cargoes worth £150,000 were lost and 1,000 seamen were drowned. Many of the surviving sailors struggled ashore only to be killed and stripped by ghoulish wreckers waiting on the beaches. The warship Cumberland ran on a sandbar in a blinding downpour of sleet and heeled over with crashing masts, but almost superhuman efforts saved the rest of the naval squadron from destruction. When the anchors were carried away, the seamen lashed cannon to cables to hold the ship's head to the wind. In the battleship Coventry, eight men were blown overboard as they clawed their way along the open deck. The Hastings and the Hector, followed by a few merchantmen, succeeded in beating their way into the open sea, then were forced back with their sails ripped to ribbons and their timbers leaking. Though southern and western Britain felt the storm's greatest fury, disaster struck the North Sea coast where a large convoy of ships was sheltering just inside Spurn Head at the mouth of the Humber. The gale made the fire on Spurnhead light tower burn so fiercely that the heat melted the iron bars on which the coals rested. At dawn on November 27th, the lighthouse keeper Peter Walls counted 25 dismasted hulks wallowing in the bay. In the days that followed, more than 500 bodies were cast up on the nearby coasts of Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. Almost every harbour in Britain told the same tragic story of death and destruction, and weeks passed before it was possible to estimate the total extent of the disaster. At Portsmouth, 14 big ships went down as they tried to get out of the harbour, or were torn from their moorings and dashed to pieces against the stone quays under the eyes of townsfolk. Others reached the open channel, only to be driven onto the northern coast of France. One ship crept into Cherbourg and was shattered by French fortress guns when she fired a signal of distress. Nowhere was the chaos more fearful than in the River Thames, where about 700 ships of every size lay moored in the crowded stream from London Bridge down to Gravesend. The storm struck London on the afternoon of November 26. By nightfall, 200 people had been killed and 500 injured by falling walls and chimneys, and thousands were fleeing in terror from the city into the rain-lashed countryside. The author, Daniel Defoe, saw the lead roof of Westminster Abbey stripped off and rolled up like parchment. The streets were choked with rubble, and 100 great elms planted by Cardinal Wolsey lay uprooted in St James Park. Eight ships were driven aground on the Thames waterfront. At Wapping, their bowsprits and tumbling masts crashed through the walls of buildings along the river.
Five big ships heavily laden with cargo for the West Indies were ripped from their moorings and carried by wind and tide far into the marshes near Tilbury Fort, where their contents were soon plundered by the local inhabitants. Further down the estuary, the man-of-war Royal Catherine founded in the entrance to the River Medway, though most of the crew struggled through the freezing mud and reeds to safety. The loss of small craft on the Thames could never be calculated. One estimate was that 300 barges, ferries and boats were wrecked and 1,000 boatmen perished with them. Britain was by far the worst sufferer from the great storm, but the havoc extended all along the Atlantic coast of Europe from Spain to Denmark, and the total death toll of mariners was believed to be at least 20,000.